57 minutes. What I told you. I told you. Yeah, take it down. Hello, hello, and welcome back around this diamond we like to call first to third. I'm your host, Dre Ingram. I got my usual suspects in the building with me today, Lou and Leon. Fellas, how you doing? Doing good. Hello, America. Hey, Leon way in the back. He can't get to the mic right now. But uh, listen, guys, we have a, a very special treat for you guys tonight. If you've heard any of our eight previous shows, you know that um, we uh, often advertise Mike's Olympics Gym it's the trainer that I've been working out with for the last 11 years. We've just been reminiscing over here about it feels just like yesterday, that first time I came in the gym and left weary, but uh, now I'm much stronger and much appreciative uh, for it. And we have Mike Craven in the building with us today, and he will be talking about some very important things. Um, if you guys don't know, the NFL training camps will be starting next week. And if you live in the East Coast or really any part of America in the last week, you know about the intense heat uh, that is out there right now. It's uh, it's mind boggling. It's 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 draining, but uh, that won't stop these athletes from training in this heat. And uh, and so, look, we got camps coming up. We got athletes training in it, high intensity. What is the proper way to work out in these types of conditions? And uh, Mike, I'm going to hand it over to you and kind of uh, let you explain what True Fitness Solutions is all about. We will have a myriad of guests for you guys tonight, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Richard Close, who's a neurosurgeon. And uh, he'll be on the line in about three minutes, but I'm going to give it to Mike so he can explain kind of his vision of True Fitness Solution and what it is he actually does. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, True Fitness Solutions, this is a program I started 15 years ago, and it was to provide a service that would educate, evaluate, and offer exercise prescription at a cost-effective price that if you were to confer with your doctor, he would be in agreement with. So what we got to get doing today with the reactive and the preventative side of healthcare is bring unity to team issues, especially issues that are controlled through safety, performance, and liability. And that's basically what this program is about, how it relates to exertional heat stroke. Thank you, Mike. And like I said, guys, um, you know, we're glad to have Mike in the building with us today. We will be talking to uh, just just multiple guests and uh, all from different backgrounds. We'll be talking to doctors. We'll be talking to NFL team doctors. We'll be talking to uh, college uh, strength and conditioning coaches. It's really uh, an exciting show for this first hour and a very informational show. Uh, so you guys keep it locked throughout the entire time. This is first and third on Live 365 Soul Cipher Radio. Again, glad to have Mike Craven in with us today. We will be having Dr. Close calling in in just a few moments. And, uh, again, this is education. Uh, so if you know of anyone uh, who will be participating in these types of camps pretty soon, um, then be sure to listen in tonight and be sure to let others know about uh, what's going on as well. So uh, you guys be close to – well, make sure you pay attention to tonight's show. Lou, you know, um, we, we just reminisced about Mike a second ago. You were actually the one that dropped me off of that first workout. What are your memories of Mike? I just remember walking in and just seeing this, this guy standing there. Like, he's just staring at us like, okay, what do you got going on? What do you guys need to do? And we didn't really know what to truly say to him. Um, I, I just remember just talking about, you know, wanting to make sure – you know that you got better which meant getting stronger and and faster uh being able to recover uh more quickly mm -hmm. and i think we just kind of spilled the beans to mike in regards to that and and to be honest he kind of took over from there um i watched as he put you through all sorts of exercises and activities yeah. and um I, I, I will tell you this. I, I remember you walking to the car and getting in and said, man, that hurt. All of that hurt. <laughs> but, you know, um, fast forward, you know, to where you are now. And it, it's just been a blessing, truly, to uh, have met Mike and to have uh, 
has seen you work with him and then it's branched off into uh, other friends that we have who are uh, mm -hmm. you know heavy into professional athletics so uh, truly just really an, an honor to, to know Mike and to know that he is so heavily involved in all of the work that we have here and uh, we're gonna pause for a quick second and answer our call I believe um, go ahead Lou I believe this is uh, Dr. Close on the line Dr. Close hi is that Andre yes yes it is how you doing I'm good. You hear me okay? Yes, yes. We hear you perfectly clear. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and let you guys kind of uh, chit-chat about um, just this heat stroke awareness. You've really been beating the drum on this for a long time now. We want to give this information and education to our listeners. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Thank you. How are you doing tonight, Dr. Close? I'm great. It's real hot up here. It's a good, good time to have this topic. I, I hear you, and I appreciate you doing everything that you're doing. I want to tell our viewing audience a little bit. I met Dr. Close. I saw this article that was written, and the title of the article was Education, Preparation is Needed to Help Prevent Heat-Related Deaths. When I saw the article, I knew immediately I had to drive wherever I had to drive to meet this man because he was talking about issues outside of the norm that, that when we talk about why exertional heat stroke today still occurs, and it's because certain people in leadership position aren't listening. So to give you an example for what Dr. Close elaborates more, let me read a couple of the paragraphs that were written. No one ever needs to die because of heat illness. They do because people are not prepared appropriately. While college and high school programs have implemented plans to protect players from the heat, including hydration and weight check programs, and reserving full pad practices for cooler segments of the day, avoiding heat stroke requires several other precautionary measures. Close likens heat stroke to a medical emergency that is fatal if left untreated or completely treated, and he, and he, and he gives you an example. It's an example of the malfunctioning of the cooling system. He goes on to say heat stroke is a circulatory disease it's much like the cooling system in your car. If the cooling system in your car fails, the whole car is going to fail quickly. The heart powers the body's cooling system. If the heart can't deliver blood efficiently to the sweat glands throughout the body, there'll be no cooling and heat acclimatization will fail. Dr. Close, take it away. Well, it's, it's, it's a disease that's totally preventable. And, and yet, I think, Mike, you, you kept track last year. I think there were three deaths among high school football players on the eastern seaboard alone. Is that mm. correct? That's correct. Since 1995, um, and there's no coach in America that restricts water, there's been an average of 2.8 deaths a year. And, and we're not talking about wild behavior, uh, drunken driving, or, or doing all the crazy things that we did as teenagers we're, we're talking about prime high school athletes and and it's heartbreaking and as I'm sure you'll you'll uh, uh, point out later it's not limited to the high schools you know people say well we just have lack of resources well the Minnesota Vikings had unlimited resources and they mm -hmm. lost a football player so it is it is really uh, something that 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 must be stopped and and as you'll point out uh, during the, your program, the measures are very simple. It, it's nothing fancy, uh, but they're very, very simple. And uh, as we said earlier, the drum needs to be beaten uh, because we, uh, we have it with us, and if we let down our guard, if we don't repeat the same simple preventative steps year after year after year, we're going to have this heartbreak go on. Dr. I'm liking Coach. it to the... Uh, uh, the rules in high school football about the technique used in tackling. And you, you, you know better than I do that uh, a player can be disqualified for using his head as a battering ram. And with that rule change, which actually was brought, brought about by a former professor of mine who just had a tenacious, has a tenacious personality, would not let up until it was acknowledged and the rules were changed, and now we see far fewer uh, uh, neck fractures. 
Dr. Close, that's, that's it, people who won't let up. Uh, another point of the article that, that I want to bring out, because, again, it's just so clear, is, is you're saying athletes should achieve a level of good cardiovascular fitness outside of the heat and then acclimatize themselves to hotter temperatures before taking to the field for strenuous workouts. Now, that's, that's a huge statement because the way it is today from Little League all the way up, the first day of practice, because the game is a, a power speed sport, we've got athletes jumping into high intensity that produces more heat 15 times than what's produced at rest. And there's no steady rate VO2 peak training to bring about physiological changes to be more heat fit before we start producing the heat. So this, this, this is what really jumped out at me to say this uh, Dr. Close is hitting the head on the nail. We've got kids with lower P VO2s than probably in the 60s with bigger body masses, but we're ignoring the aerobic system as a measured strength. Well, that, that's what impressed me about meeting, meeting you, be, be, because before that, uh, the, the, the ways of, of preventing uh, uh, this occurrence were involved uh, the coaches meeting in the spring. And, and telling the players, don't bother showing up unless you can run a mile in such and such a time. And uh, that, that was uh, effective uh, because it put across to the players two things. Number one, they have to start training right away. Uh, and they have to start training with the boring stuff like running, running hills, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but it also uh, uh, made them uh, show up uh, with a, a relative baseline of conditioning. Now I've come to learn uh, from you that you have a, a screening test, and I've seen it done, uh, and I'm most impressed by it. And, and, and it's, it's, it's simple. It takes, what, about 20 minutes? And I think uh, uh, people pay more for a, a, a night out with a, with a, a burger and a movie uh, than they will to have this, this test done. Yeah, that's exactly right, Doc. It's, it's uh, Dr. Bozic, who's going to be on later, who does um, uh, testing and assessments, and he runs the, the physiological lab at, at Armstrong Atlantic University. He's going to be speaking in depth on it. But the peak VO2 has been available for years, and it's just an issue to, to whether we take advantage of what exercise science offers and then f find a way to make it cost-effective that every young man gets identified before we even start. Well, exactly, and I think uh, as, as a sidelight to that, and I, I, I mentioned it, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it's important. I think the Army's learned this. The physical exam, uh, that the pre-sports pre, uh, pre physical, should be carefully done. It should be taken seriously because if somebody has a heart murmur uh, that has been undetected, uh, that needs to be discovered before. Uh, that person is asked to exert him or herself. You know, uh, young women are not immune to heat stroke. They're they're all at risk. Of course, football players are bigger, and they're wearing pads. But but I think uh, I, th I think parents listening should understand that before you send your kid out to play sports, take him to a doc, and 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 we don't want the doc just to look at him and sign a paper. Uh, they really ought to examine them. You know, D Dr. Close, getting back to that, that last point you made in the article about cardiovascular fitness should be developed before strenuous high-intensity workouts, I'm going to read right now from an exercise physiology journal that what you just said in that, in that quote, how it sums it up. During high-intensity sprinting at max effort, like football practice, 88% of cardiac output blood flow goes to the muscle and 2% goes to the skin. What this means is whether you have a high VO2 or a low VO2, doing the sprint activity, only 2% of blood flow is going to the skin for heat release. When the sprint is stopped, if you have a high VO2 reflected in a high cardiac output, there'll be an increase in blood flow sent to the skin for heat release. The more repeated sprints done with short rest periods, the more heat that becomes stored in athletes with low VO2. The American College of Sports Medicine, 
The Encyclopedia of Sports Medicine and Science states athletes under 40 milliliters per kilo per minute as having a low heat tolerance, which puts them at higher risk for high-intensity repeated effort. Yeah, and to my mind, that's, that's breakthrough. You know, that now, now we have a number, and that number is easy to achieve. Uh, and and I, I think this, this is terrific uh, in terms of wiping out uh, heat, heat-related deaths. Well, look, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Close, and again, all, everything you do with the education and, and, and even the way, again, you had a meathead like me call you, and I wanted to drive five hours to speak to you and, you, and, and you made time for me. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Close. Well, thank you for all you've done. All right. Thanks again, Dr. Close. Okay, Andre, see you later. All right. All right, and uh, guys, we're going to take a quick break and uh, get on with our next guest. You're listening to First to Third on Live 365 Soul Cipher Radio. Mike's Olympics Gym, celebrating 30 years of competing to be the best. We offer True Fitness Solutions. True Fitness Solutions is a program that offers education to what is evidence-based, evaluations that identify levels of fitness like peak VO2 testing, an exercise prescription that is written to the exercise tolerance of the individual. Mike's Olympics Gym with the True Fitness Solutions program is the answer to a healthier America. With everything from fat cell reduction, decrease in blood pressure, blood sugar, reverse type 2 diabetes, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides, all of these things are possible with increases in peak VO2 scores. True Fitness Solutions brings unity between the prevention and reactive sides of healthcare. Buy in. Your doctor, True Fitness Solutions, and yourself have the opportunity as a team to stop pretending and start competing. Call now for a free presentation from Mike Craven to see how to change your life at 804-543-9293. Again, that's 804-543-9293. And be sure to check out True Fitness Solutions on Facebook. And we're back at uh, First to Third on Live 365 Soul Cipher Radio. We just finished talking with Dr. Close, and we want to thank him again for coming on the line and really talking about something that's not being taught um, that it, that desperately needs to be taught. As uh, Mike mentioned a while ago, um, three uh, three heat-related deaths um, a year on average, and uh, in my eyes, that's just three too much. And, uh, Mike, you guys talked about uh, peak VO2 testing do you want to give our listeners a, a kind of an insight of what peak VO2 testing actually is and how it's done? Yes, sir. Peak VO2 is basically a measurement of the volume of oxygen that can be delivered and used. And it's a measure of, of aerobic capacity. So athletes you see, like some of these Lance Armstrong, high-endurance high type athletes, can have VO2s as high in the 80s. For most of your sports that are field-based sports, you're going to see very good athletes. Soccer players are going to be every bit as high as 60 or 60 to probably 72. Football players, the higher their peak VO2s, the quicker they're going to recover between downs. It's going to enable them to play a, a game with a higher tempo if they can replenish the energy currency called ATPPC faster. So it's a, it's a form of strength, just like any other form of strength. And the big issue with obesity today is we've got people today that don't know it, but their peak VO2s are steadily declining. And what that means is their ability to use fat for energy is steadily going down. And I'm sure Dr. Dr. Bozic, who's going to be coming later, will speak about the, these issues of assessments and how even for the non-athlete they have an important variables. So, again, peak VO2 is, is if somebody wants to have a high endurance, nonstop repeat power over and over, you got to have some base level. And thank you for that, Mike. I believe that's our next guest coming on right now. And uh, I believe this is Dr. Godek. Hi, you on first to third. State your name, please. Hello? Did we lose him? Okay, no problem. Um, again, uh, we're having uh, Mike mentioned Dr. Bosick. We're going to have him on a little later. But uh, coming up now, we should have Dr. Godek on the line, and she's going to be talking about um, the many risk factors outside of dehydration, as Mike was mentioning earlier. Dr. Godek, are you on the line? Yes, I am. 
Okay, great to have you. Um, I'm going to toss it over to Mike and let you guys talk about, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the biggest misconception is that all heat-related illnesses uh, come from dehydration. But as Mike mentioned, you know, teams are no longer restricting water, so it's something else there. Uh, you've been working with the Philadelphia Eagles uh, here recently, over the last few years, actually. Um, I'm a, again, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and kind of let you, let him uh, conduct the interview and chit-chat with you about what's going on. That sounds great. How you doing tonight, Dr. Goddard? I'm doing good, Mike. Thank you very much for, for being on with us tonight. Absolutely. My pleasure. Doctor, again, uh, anybody who researches what the science shows, your name pops up everywhere. And again, uh, you're the director of the Westchester Heat Institute that does this research for people as athletic trainers, coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, to make us more aware. Can you talk a little bit about that That uh, article that was written that, that I called you about when I first wanted to speak to you, but the title of the article was Core Temperature and Percent of Dehydration in Professional Football Linemen and Defensive Backs. Can you talk a little bit about that research study you did? Yeah, that was, uh, was actually a follow-up study to one that I had done um, at Westchester University using um, our football players and uh, some of our cross-country runners. Um, so the, the, the uh, next year I went, was able to go up to the Philadelphia Eagles training camp. And actually, this Monday will be my t starting my 10th year collecting data up there uh, with those players. So I have an awful lot of core temperature um, and percent dehydration data um, you know, in my data bank. Uh, but the, the real interesting finding of both of those studies, actually, was that um, I found absolutely no correlation between what we typically call dehydration, which is the body uh, weight loss that occurs during practice. Uh, there's no correlation between uh, dehydration and the highest core temperature that the athletes reach. And I'm at the point now where I have well over a thousand data points in actual collegiate and professional football players during practice, um, looking at how hot they get and how dehydrated they are. And interestingly, very often the hottest players are the least dehydrated and the players that don't get so hot are, are actually the most dehydrated so um, you know this idea that dehydration causes um, causes body temperature to go up really is is somewhat of a fallacy and, and it can be kind of explained as to why people think that's the case uh, and I gave a recent talk actually at our national NATA convention and explained the fact that um, just because somebody loses weight that doesn't mean that that det that's a determining factor for a high core temperature. The, the common factor between an elevated core temperature and body weight loss is metabolic rate, and that's exactly what you were talking about, is how hard the players work. So an increase in metabolic rate, or work rate, so to speak, will increase body temperature. We know that from um, laboratory studies as well as field studies. So the harder you work, the hotter you get. Um, but most people also don't realize that the harder you work, the faster you sweat, and the more you sweat, the higher sweat rate, and that's what determines how much body weight you lose. So it's the metabolic rate that drives both core temperature and sweat rate, and as a, an aside to that, as a, as a secondary factor, the higher sweat rate is going to cause a greater amount of dehydration. So people take that as meaning the dehydration causes the high core temperature when in fact it doesn't. It may be associated in some situations, but it doesn't cause the high core temperature. So, so I've been trying to spend the last 10 years educating people to the fact that there's, there's something else that elevates core temperature. There's something else, for instance, that causes exertional heat stroke. Um, and, you know, we, we really know it's not, it's not dehydration. It's, if you look at, um, data that comes out of the Israeli army. I, I read a lot of military data because it, it, it applies very well to football population, which is the population I study. But if, if you look at some good data coming out of, of uh, Israel, looking at soldiers, um, they list three or four things that two-thirds of the time, two-thirds of the time to 100% of the time, these are factors that cause a fatal heat stroke. And one of the factors is um, physical effort unmatched to physical fitness, which means the soldiers are not fit enough and the effort that they're asked to, to provide is too high and they have an exertional heat stroke episode. Um, one of the other ones is simply low physical fitness level. 
as well as improper work rest ratios and improper acclimatization. But in none of those top factors is dehydration even, even mentioned. So clearly, um, in you know, many different areas, if you read the literature throughout the world, um, it's becoming pretty clear that we need to, we need to really educate people that um, you know, just keeping your athletes hydrated on the field is not going to prevent an exertional heat stroke. Dr. Goddick, another good point that I saw in this article that just jumped out at me is, and I'm going to quote it, plausible explanations for greater heat storage and higher core temperature in linemen include a larger body mass and lower body surface area to mass ratio. Additionally, linemen have lower aerobic fitness, and then you clarify level than backs as measured by VO2 max. Absolutely. Absolutely. We measured, actually, I have the, the uh, I referenced the article that, that I did on our collegiate players, and we actually did VO2 max tests in the laboratory on all of those subjects, both the uh, football players and the cross-country runners. And I have that data in front of me. The average VO2 max in our football players was um, 44 ml per kg per minute. And I know for a fact that the lowest in one of our linemen was 29 ml per kg per minute, whereas the average you know, mean uh, VO2 max for our cross-country runners was 71. So, you know, clearly there's a huge difference in, in aerobic capacity between um, large players in particular and, and even our smaller players, like generally our, our backs and receivers had a higher VO2 max. Um, so certainly that, that plays a role. And as far as the body mass goes, anyone with a larger mass working at the same intensity as someone at a, with a smaller mass is always going to have a higher core temperature. They're going to generate more heat. So bigger people doing the same task as smaller people will be hotter simply because of the mass, you know, the muscle mass generating the heat. Um, and you play into that, too, the idea of body surface area to mass ratio. What that is is kind of taking your skin area, um, which is needed to dissipate the heat. If you divide that by your body mass, the larger you are, the smaller that ratio becomes. And since um, athletes need to be able to get rid of the heat primarily through evaporation of sweat, um, larger people actually have a smaller area to do that compared to the mass that they have. Um, so there are many factors that play a role in you know, why I think um, linemen, for instance, are at more risk than, you know, than, your, than your smaller players. Some of it is fitness, absolutely. But some of it is just the difference in the, physio the physical characteristics that, that play a role in the physiological effect. So with that point, so strong, if I'm a strength coach and my job is to make kids bigger, let's make the kids big. I'm going I'm to put on 20 pounds of muscle. Irrespective if it's muscle or fat, it's increased mass that takes away from the surface area compared to the kid in the 60 that was 6'4", 180. He's 6'4", now 280. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, and if I do that and I don't train the aerobic system as a measured strength that can be identified through VO2, right. I, I'm really doing things that make him at, at, at jeopardy, a walking heat bomb. Absolutely. And it really does go back to the cardiovascular system because you only have so much, I always teach my students, you only have so much blood to go around. So the average person might have, the average football player might have six and a half liters of blood. And when you exercise, um, when you exercise even in a cool environment, you have to continue to pump blood to, to the heart, you have to continue to pump it to the brain, and you, can, you pump it to the muscles that are working. Um, and when you go into an environment where you have to dissipate heat, a, a large amount of that blood has to be taken to the skin in order to transfer the heat from inside the body to the skin, where it can then cause sweating and, and, and cause the evaporation of sweat. So the harder you exercise, in the heat, um, the more of a stress there is in the cardiovascular system because there's only so much blood to go around, right? Now, mm -hmm. to your point, the more fit you are, the more able you are to circulate blood per minute. So clearly, more fit people are better able to um, withstand that cardiovascular stress that occurs um, when you exercise in the heat. Dr. Goddick, real, also, this was a huge point. Could you speak about when you did that study 
of the cross country runners compared to the football and the nature of the football practice versus the nature of the cross country. I'm going to read the follow up of this. It was additionally, core temperature was not related to the level of dehydration as measured in either of our groups of athletes and may depend more on the t exercise type and intensity. Frequent rest breaks for football players and decreased exercise intensity for cross country runners are important considerations when these athletes are exercising in the heat. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, cross country runner, we literally had them running around the football fields and it would happen to be in the 90s both days. And the football players were in full pads, they're out on the field. Um, and the fact that they're able to take more breaks, which is important, um, you know, allows their core temperature to either stop going up or even come down a little bit, whereas the cross-country runners, if you are running continuously, you don't have that ability. So most people exercising continuously, your core temperature goes up, and then it does usually plateau. Um, what we don't understand is why some people then continue to rise, you know, and might cause an exertional heat stroke. But that core temperature reaching a certain level should actually trigger your brain to decrease exercise intensity. So obviously when you exercise in the heat, if you're not used to it, you can't run as fast. You can't, you can't work out as hard, right? And this kind of oppressive heat we have right now, even fit people find that they can't work as hard because they get hot too soon and it triggers their brain to say, whoa, you know, I gotta kind of protect, gotta protect my body here. I need to decrease my, my exercise intensity. Now in a sport like football, when breaks are, you know, are inherent to the practice, that does allow them to, you know, uh, keep, the, you know, have their core temperature actually come down a little bit. And one of the key things we found, we actually did not just core temperature, but skin temperature um, while we were doing that study. And we found a big difference, even if the players take their helmets off um, in skin temperature underneath the helmets. And there's a big difference um, conditioning-wise if they take their shoulder pads and helmets off when they condition versus when they condition in their pads. And my feeling is there's really no reason to have these kids out there doing their end of the practice conditioning in full pads and a helmet. That's, it's, not, it's not helpful. Dr. Goddard, thank you so much uh, for giving us the time to, to be able to talk about these important issues. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. And um, that was Dr. Godek again. She's been working with the uh, Philadelphia Eagles and uh, about to start again on Monday. So uh, you guys keep it locked right here. We're going to go to a quick break uh, for just a second, and then we'll be on with Dr. Bosak. You guys keep it locked right here. It's first to third on Live 365 Soul Cypher Radio. Hey, ladies and gents. It's Dre from first to third. If you're anything like me, you're always looking for the next challenge or the next excuse to get off the couch and out of the house. Well, today I'm here to encourage you to take up the challenging and fulfilling sport of golf by going to see our friends at First Tee of Richmond, located at 400 School Street. First Tee of Richmond is a state-of-the-art practice and play destination conveniently located in the city of Richmond. The facility features a large grass practice tee for all season practice, as well as a heated and covered practice area for a more private experience. Whether you're playing golf for the first time or an experienced golfer looking to sharpen your skills, the facility also offers a six-hole par three course designed to offer true course practice for golfers of all ages. Visit our friends at First Tee and take advantage of their extended summer hours from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday through Saturday. Interested in private lessons or their youth program? Give them a call at 804-646-4074 or inquire online at the First Tee Richmond, Chesterfield.org. Again, that's 804-646-4074. 4074 or the first tee richmond chesterfield.org the first tee of richmond providing a healthy experience through the game of golf mike's olympics gym celebrating 30 years of competing to be the best we offer true fitness solutions true fitness solutions is a program that offers education to what is evidence-based evaluations that identify levels of fitness like peak vo2 testing an exercise prescription that is written to the exercise tolerance of the individual. Mike's Olympics Gym with the True Fitness Solutions program is the answer to a healthier America. With everything from fat cell reduction, decrease in blood pressure, blood sugar, reverse type 2 diabetes, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides, all of these things are possible with increases in peak VO2 scores. 
True Fitness Solutions brings unity between the prevention and reactive sides of healthcare. Buy in. Your doctor, True Fitness Solutions, and yourself have the opportunity as a team to stop pretending and start competing. Call now for a free presentation from Mike Craven to see how to change your life at 804-543-9293. Again, that's 804-543-9293. And be sure to check out True Fitness Solutions on Facebook. Party people! Do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? No, seriously. What time is it? Where's your watch? Broke, busted, got you disgusting? First and third listeners, this is Kevin. Here to encourage you to take that broken watch out of the drawer and down to Wallace Jewels. Richmond's oldest watch repair and jewelry shop. Located at 19 East Broadway Street. Where, for over 100 years, the Waller family has served the people of Richmond, Virginia. Waller and Company not only offer jewelry repair, they also offer a unique selection of wedding rings, gold and diamond jewelry, watches, and other fine gifts for that special occasion. Waller and Company's unique and classic jewelry can now also be purchased online at wallerjewelry.com. Stop by and see Mark or David, the Waller Brothers, at 19 East Broad Street, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Or just give them a call at 648-1044. That's 648-1044. Waller & Company, your unique jewelry location. Okay, fellas, it's Kevin from First to Third here to tell you about the awesome quality and service being offered by our friends at 707, Richmond's premier clothing store, located at 310 East Broad Street. 707 is a family-owned company operating in downtown Richmond for more than 30 years. 707 offers a vast selection of men's clothing consisting of fine suits and dress shirts as well as finishings ranging from belts and shoes to neckties and cufflinks that coordinate to complete each ensemble. Visit Dial Bazzani and his team of fashion experts Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Or give them a call at 804-643-0086 to set up a personalized fit. Again, dial and staff at 310 East Broad Street. Or give them a call at 804-643-0086. 707, the leader in men's fine clothing. And we're back live here at First to Third on Live 365 Soul Cypher Radio. We want to again thank uh, Dr. Godek for coming on and speaking with us for a bit. Um, we have Dr. Bosack on the line, I believe. Dr. Bosack, are you there? Dr. Bosack, are you there? Yes. All right, thank you for joining us. Sorry for the long break. Had a couple technical difficulties. Um, I'm going to toss it over to Mike and let you guys uh, go on about the things you have going on, talking about uh, the exercise science of the VO2. Okay, thanks. How you doing tonight, Dr. Bozic? Uh, yes, hey, how are you, Mike? Good. Hey, Doc, why don't we just jump right in and, and um, tell them a little bit what you do in, in your lab. And, and the way I met you was at a strength uh, conditioning clinic, and you were talking about assessments. Go ahead and, and let's uh, start off getting a good a explanation of the VO2, and then we're going to get into how your thoughts are on human performance and even sports that are repeat power sports the benefit of having aerobic strength. Okay. Well, just real quick, as you mentioned, Mike, we, we met at the Juniata Strength and Conditioning Clinic uh, just over a month back, and uh, Doug Smith was gracious enough to give me a chance to speak about sports performance analysis and assessment. And as you and I both know, and of course with the people that are listening tonight, and Andre, of course, putting the show on, knows that VO2 does play a role in all sports. Uh, you know, typically, and you had mentioned this earlier tonight about 
maximal aerobic capacity, of course, being VO2, and that's basically the ability of the body, specifically the body's tissues, muscles, for example, organs, to utilize oxygen. Just again, reviewing. So what a lot of people think, though, is, okay, that's important for endurance performance. For example, distance runners, you mentioned Lance Armstrong earlier tonight, cycling, of course, Tour de France being on, uh, coming to a close this Sunday. And, of course, when we think about that, that really isn't a, really isn't a big, uh, it's, not a, it's not a large stretch to go, okay, we can see how maximum aerobic capacity plays a role for, um, for those type of sports, swimming, canoeing, kayaking. However, the thing that often gets overlooked is actually the importance of aerobic capacity for repeated team sport performance. And ironically, with team sports, such as football, for example, a lot of times there's a great emphasis on high-intensity activity. But the key thing, and you mentioned earlier tonight, is it's not just one or two high-intense efforts so that the player is able to do something incredibly hard and incredibly fast incredibly intense in the first quarter and that's about it as you and I both know in football it's a four quarter game and we want our players to be able to still be putting forth an incredibly amount of high intense efforts repetitively in the fourth quarter as well as in the third and the second so with peak VO2 and, and depending upon what mode you use to assess aerobic capacity Really what we're talking about is VO2 max if we're obtaining it on a treadmill. And in this case, it's not just important, again, for your aerobic athlete, but as you're talking about tonight, your anaerobic athletes, your repetitive athletes. Mm -hmm. And my uh, area of research has been analyzing team sport performance, so teams like basketball, soccer, lacrosse, distance running, football, and looking at changes during the course of the season, and one of the things we measure is aerobic capacity. And I would suggest that it's just as important as many of the other factors that we sometimes take for granted in your team sports, like agility and power and obviously repetitive uh, anaerobic efforts. But again, the goal is not just to have one or two good repetitive efforts. It's Basically, I want the, my athlete to be just as strong in the latter part of the game, able to have another sprint, able, uh, in the case of football, offensive line or defensive line, able to hold the line, able to block. Give my If it's the O-line, give my quarterback enough time in the pocket to get the ball out. And if it's my defense... Uh, then, uh, you know, defensive, then obviously to, to try to make a tackle, to try to make a stop. So... We forget, though, that there's an incredible relationship between your topic tonight, heat exertion in the mm -hmm. cardiovascular system, and also performance. So in our lab, and not just in our lab here, but in various labs I've worked in at, at prior schools, is I've always assessed athletes, basically their characteristics all around. So if they're, if they're re reduced, say, or, or not as high as they should be in a particular aspect for their sport, whether it's agility, whether it's power, whether it's aerobic power, whether it's mean power, then we look at trying to not just assess it, but also give them ways to improve it. More important, translate that to game performance because that's the biggest thing. And, Mike, I know when we were at Judiana in the strength training and conditioning clinic there, one of the things we tried to stress was that we have to understand what the number means, but we have to understand how it applies to game performance. So earlier tonight, Dr. Close, and you had talked about 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And people might say, well, what does that mean? Well, you and I both know if that was a VO2 for, say, a collegiate distance runner or a high school runner, uh, they might not be all that good in distances 5,000 meters and above, and some could even argue it would hinder them in, say, the mile or 1,500 meters. But if we look at that from anaerobic team sport performance, then that's not necessarily bad, but we really want to see if we can try and get that higher. Exactly. You know what, uh, Dr. Bosick, let me interrupt you for just one second. We had a couple of technical difficulties, so you guys may be listening and not know who's speaking right now. This is Dr. Andy Bosak 
uh, a professor in sports medicine at uh, Atlantic uh, State University. So uh, I just wanted to give our listeners that little bit of information. Go ahead and continue, Dr. Bosek. I'm going to hand it over to Mike again. Um, but uh, some of our viewers or listeners got cut off. I just wanted to make sure they know who they were uh, listening to. So, Dr. Bosek. Dr. Bosick, I mean, everything you're talking right now, then Vince Lombardi wasn't too far off. Fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. And if we don't have the ability for the aerobic system because it's not trained as a strength, if it's too deficient, you're going to be the person who's not going to be able to replenish those PC stores as fast as somebody who worked the aerobic system. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing is this, too. When, when you think that, when you think of fatigue and, and you look at its impact, on football performance, for example, just minor fatigue, minor fatigue. So if we're looking at an athlete that we're asking for repetitive peak power output, repetitive efforts now throughout the whole game, but for lack of better terms, they're gassed by halftime. And they come out in the third quarter, and because they had halftime, they're going to feel a little bit better. But probably halfway through the quarter, third quarter, they're gassed again. And now, here's the interesting thing, just a little bit of fatigue, muscular strength is reduced when we look at repetitive movement patterns those are the prolonged ones such as holding the line that ability to do that that's reduced if we look at a running back with agility or a cornerback or receiver their agility is reduced neuromuscular coordination is reduced when we look at whole body speed again highly important for your running backs important for your age backs that's also reduced and here's a big one that we often forget. Concentration and alertness is reduced. That's so if you look, okay, good. just a little bit of fatigue that could perhaps be the, the severity of that said fatigue could be reduced by having a slightly better cardiovascular conditioned athlete to play a role in reducing the severity of decline of all these other factors that are, are playing an integral role on the football field. And who would think that when you think of aerobic capacity? You know, generally most people think that's just a runner running around the track and whoever's the one that wins the race. Putting it in just, you know, generic terms, but basically the importance of aerobic ability in all team sports is just that, more important than what people know. Yeah, that's huge because, again, we it's real quick to label somebody that he takes breaks between downs, he has no heart, he's not tough, but... What you're talking about is you've got to have a person with an underdeveloped system because there wasn't time made to develop it. Absolutely. I mean, that is that is a great, great point. Because one of the things I've noticed, and, and I've, I've uh, been blessed, again, to be part of several research studies that have data to show this at the end of the season where you have some athletes that are detrained. And that's a bit of a concern if you look at their cardiovascular system, of course, measured by maximum oxygen consumption, a.k.a. VO2 max, if that's reduced at the end of the year, that's a telltale sign. You've either got some detraining going on. We also have some data that suggests overtraining can contribute to this as well. But you're absolutely right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ultimately, it's not always that the fact that the athlete doesn't have the heart. It's just the fact that if the body can't do it, then there's a problem. And if that's something that could be taken care of prior to you know, the season, say in the off season, the base season, and, of course, even in the preseason and essentially maintain, because, again, the thing that we, we don't want, you know, uh, coaches and players in, in power sports to think is that, okay, we're trying to make distance runners out of football players. Not at all. Exactly. Uh, I think Mike and Andre, I think we could agree if I turn around and said tonight, oh, I think all football players should run 10 miles, that would get them really conditioned for their sport. You guys would probably both say I'm an idiot. <laughs> and, and I would agree, but it's looking at how how long are they on the football team? Uh, not on the football team, the football field cumulative, meaning the length of time for their repetitive efforts. If we look at that, you can often in the off season, even in the preseason, come up with cardiovascular workouts that can train them for that. And we don't want to just train them for only the maximum cumulative effort time, let's say they're on there for a total of 13 minutes, 14 minutes, 15 minutes. And it's often easier understood in hockey when you often hear at the end of the game, you know, a defenseman played 26 minutes or 28 minutes. Uh, one of the centers only played seven minutes. And 
often use that in terms of the quality of the player and based off what salary they're even going to get. But interesting enough, what comes out of there is that athlete has to be conditioned to go past that time frame. Put it in another perspective, we use the sport of soccer and you say, okay, well, in college soccer, the halves are 45 minutes. So 90 minutes cumulative for a game. If we're only training them for that, we're wrong. We truly need to consider that they may go into overtime. And if they do that, that could be as much as another 30 minutes tacked on to the end time of 90 plus injury time. You're conditioning them for more than 120. So if, if you, you take that back to football, uh, American football, which is what we're talking about tonight, is we, we just can't condition them from a standpoint of meeting the needs. We have to find a way for repetitive anaerobic training, basically circuit training when you think about it, to go more than the length of time that they're going to be on the field. And when you look at position specificity, you can, you can code that. You can sit there, watch game tape, and mark how many times the athletes out on the field and how long they were, and you can categorize the level of effort. And the performance tools that are out there today, I mean, they've got uh, heart rate monitors with GPS devices. Obviously, you can't use that in a game situation. But if you were going through some plays on the field, non-contact now, but just going through some plays, you get a pretty good estimate of how long that player is going to be on there, how many hard efforts did they have, how long was that hard effort. And then you're able to design interval-type training programs to meet that, but not just that, past the amount as well. And again, for that heart, while the athlete having it in the fourth quarter, not just in the first quarter. That's a, that's a strong point. Um, one quick question left, Doc, and, and again, if, we, if we've got more teams thinking they can be successful running a high tempo or no huddle, and we see the motion analysis that most plays are between two to six seconds in the duration, but you've got play clocks that are averaging 30, 35 seconds, and you've got teams trying to run that down to 12 seconds, is it fair again to say that with that shortened rest period, you're dependent on the aerobic system not to see power performance decline. Absolutely. I mean, that's a fine statement. And interesting enough, I'm sure people, and I know that, I know that Virginia is ACC country, but uh, I'm sure people had eyes on Birmingham this weekend and looking at the SEC media days for, uh, for football. And the discussion between uh, Gus Malzahn at Auburn and I believe it is Coach Belima at Arkansas. And if anybody had caught that, this is literally what you're talking about now is the up-style offenses uh, where defenses now that are not conditioned enough, they're having problems playing against these systems. And Lima had mentioned uh, that, hey, you know, this, and I'm paraphrasing now, but you can read the article on Fox uh, Net, Fox Sports, but they were saying, well, you know, it increases the odds of potential injury because, you know, I've got a player that's fatigued and Albeit, he makes far more money than I ever will probably in my entire life. Uh, he probably makes it in one, one, uh, one month. I'm not knocking where I work. I appreciate what they give me. But I actually thought, you know what? You're not looking at it the right way. It, it's a conditioning thing. It's not even, a, well, I've got to get 15 extra seconds for my players. And that's what he was recommending, that there'd be a 15-second period where he can change out his players. It's like, well, no, it comes back to exactly what you just said, Mike. If I turn around and drop the amount of recovery between each play, and if I'm an offense, I definitely want to do this. If I've got an up style, uh, such as Oregon, for example, that's what Melzahn had at Auburn the first time and A State, and now back at, at Auburn now, is I absolutely want to be going as fast as I can to not give the defense enough time to recover. They're going to fatigue a lot quicker, and, and it may not work the first couple quarters, but definitely sooner or later the floodgates are going to open because – my O-line is going to be able to create holes for my running backs. My uh, receivers are going to be able to start out running the cornerbacks on the other team. And now we're just going to start putting points on the board. Exactly. Hey, Dr. Bosek, we can't thank you enough for coming on and uh, sharing some thoughts with us today. Uh, we got uh, our next guest coming on pretty soon. We're going to have to let you go. But, again, thank you so much for uh, coming and educating really all of our listeners. And no problem. Thank you very much to both you, Andre, and Mike. Thank you. I look forward to speaking to you sometime down the road, my friend. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Bye-bye. All right.
Again, that was Dr. Andy Bosack, a professor in sports medicine with an emphasis on exercise physi- physiology um, at Armstrong Atlantic State University. We have our next guest on calling right now, I believe. Uh, we should be on with uh, Coach Chris Stewart of the University of Richmond uh, next. And uh, I think we just had him call in. We might have lost him for a second. We'll get him back. Matter of fact, that may be him right there. Coach Stewart? Yeah, this is Coach Stewart. Hi, how you doing? It's Andre. Hey, Andre. Uh, good to have you on. Uh, coach Stewart, guys, is a strength and conditioning coach uh, at the University of Richmond, 17 years in the field. Coach, I'm going to let you and Mike get to it, um, and, and you guys talk about, uh, sort of kind of elaborate on the things we've already been discussing with uh, several team doctors and uh, professors of exercise physiology. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Mike for you. Okay, thank you. Chris, thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you, Mike. How you doing? Good. Hey, Chris, for having me. you're welcome. You know, we've talked so much about what the evidence is and issues of, of coaches, and all of us want to be the most competitive. Um, you were somebody who's been in the field, and, again, you are actually practically a- applying this, and I want you just to talk about what you've seen and what you've found. But, again, you're the man, the leader, who, who uh, is t- taking the information and practically applying it. Tell me what you found uh, working with your guys. Well, I'll tell you, you know, for one thing, it's nice to have people like you that do all the hard work and all the scientific work and then uh, and the research, and then, you know, it allows us to expand on our program. Um, I've been a strength coach for 17 years now, and it can, it, it's a science, and it continually evolves. And uh, you're always looking for ways to improve your program and, uh, and help your kids. And, um, you know, for us, um, you know, I, I'm looking for whatever edge I can get. Now, I have a philosophy. I have a, um, a program that – that you know I, I I love and 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 I, and I believe in and there's things certain things that I want to do year in year out. So whenever there is uh, a, a new ideas, uh, new research, science that's going in, and, and, and I look for ways that I can add it to what I'm doing without changing what I believe in. And uh, you know as as we start learning more about you know VO2 capacity, what the energy system actually does, what we're able to actually create with our athletes, how we're actually able to advance them. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, th- there was a big stream of sports specific, you know, football's, you know, basically the sport we're talking about. And when you talk to, to, to a lot of coaches, it's like, well, it's a stop and go sport. Well, yes, it is. And there's a certain energy system for that. Yes, there is. And this, and, and, and we train that, but the ability to, to continue to repeat the power, the capacity, the efficiency, when you start talking about those things, it's a lot more than just doing short sprints over a long duration of time. And uh, with your help, with the VO2 maxes, with your help, with uh, actually being able to to, uh, to to adapt the conditioning to fit the system, the program that we do, the allotment, the time allotment, you have to understand that I work under a lot of rules with the NCAA and how many days I can work with them, how many hours I'm limited to, and some are voluntary. So... One thing that I have to do is I have to convince these kids that this is going to help them and this is why you need to stay. And if you stay, that's great. If you want to go home, you can't. There's no, nothing here for me to keep you. But uh, we take that program. I basically ran it uh, three days a week, um, and I broke each day, uh, each conditioning uh, uh, program each day into a different phase. One phase we worked was uh, capacity, and that was where we did our longer duration with a controlled uh, recovery time. Uh, one day with efficiency, and the way I explain it to my kids, when you know, I don't want to get too scientific with them. They want to know, hey, is this going to make me better, and how is it? Uh, the short answer was, I want to make your miles per gallon uh, as efficient as possible. I want you to be able to run on one gallon of gas as long as you possibly can, and uh, and that's how I pitched it to them, and that's how they bought into it. And I said, if in order to do this, we have to train at, at your highest, your 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 your, your highest energy level we can you got to get after it and uh, that was day two and then day three was more of our power which is more specific to what you would see on the football field which would be uh four to five seconds at first and uh a very quick turnaround recovery and how fast can you recover and how and and how strong is your power output after uh, when you tap into it and grab it and ready to go again so we're uh completing uh eight weeks of our training and uh, we have been doing this uh, program progressing it uh, throughout the summer, and you know, I, I hope I, I hope that these guys um, 
we'll, we'll see a difference when they go to practice. But I know that these guys are seeing a difference right now because you know they're talking about it. And 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 when the kids are saying, "Hey, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in my life. Um, I feel like I can run for days. I feel like I can play. I can feel like I can play." You know, uh, a football game right now. That's the, that. That lets me know that these guys um, that, that it's working for them, and that these guys are developing, and these guys are getting ready to go for the fall. And your your buddy, Coach Hackney, down at Virginia State University, he's been doing the program as well, and and he's made some points that he sees that he's had some defensive linemen that were actually outperforming some of the freshman skill people that came in the first day of camp. Well, I'll tell you this. Now at, at Richmond. We're able to uh, to train our kids, and um, we have a program in the summertime that allows our freshmen to come up and train in the summertime uh, to take summer school. And so this, the the freshmen usually uh, start uh, start getting into getting on campus about halfway through. So so you think that we're four weeks into our program, and then the freshmen show up. And we're and basically what I did is I took this program and I started day one with those guys. I, obviously, I would, it wouldn't be fair to these kids to start uh, week four; they wouldn't be ready for it. So um, uh, they wouldn't be conditioned to be able to jump into week four. So uh, you know, four weeks into it, these you know our, our upperclassmen that were up here training hard, running well, they're progressing. I'm seeing a, an advancement in them, and then I get the freshmen in here and I and I, and I start training them week one, and it's night and day. Mm-hmm. It's night and day. Our linemen. That are 305, 315 pounds, six four, six five, six six guys. I mean, they, you know, they're running like deer, mm-hmm. and uh, they're they're looking great, looking athletic. They're they, you know, and then you know the, the freshman week one, they're struggling. You know, it's tough. They're struggling, and um, they're trying to learn how to work. They're trying to learn and adapt to college, and um, there's a big step there. You know, and all that has to be taken in stride, but. Um, you know the, the the conditioning levels. I can tell you right away was were, were, were night and day. And now that we are about four weeks into our freshman program, these kids are starting to really show, you know, what this program does. And they're really starting to adapt. And they are uh, they're looking the way I would expect them to look. And they're feeling good. And I've got a lineman that uh, is 330 pound freshman. And when he first got here and um, we started the program, you know, I had to start very very slow with him. I had to uh, I had to back off a lot. And uh, I can, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that, that four weeks into it, I'm seeing a good improvement, and I feel very comfortable with him entering practice and being able to handle an hour and a half of football practice. Chris, I know also you're a big Olympic lifting man, and you're, you're big on teaching the, the – I've seen you guys with excellent technique and dis, dis, displaying the lift where bar speeds at maximum velocity. Have you seen where some coaches would fear, oh, my gosh, that's going to take away from that? Have you seen any of that? Well, here's the thing, you know, I, yeah, it's always a question. It's always a question, and, you know, you're always concerned that I don't want to turn my lifters into cross-runners country runners. Well, you know, that, that is a concern, but if you understand the, the physiology behind it, you understand that we are not taking the athlete past their life threshold. We, we are not asking them to do what they're incapable of doing. We're allowing the athlete to progress at their own pace. So, like we've talked about in the past, you come into the most weight rooms in the country, most college weight rooms in the country. Every athlete is, is put onto a specific progression percentage per program that progresses them throughout their cycle. Okay, so in other words, athlete A is lifting off of his maxes, and athlete B might be lifting off of her maxes. Okay, so you you, you know they're individually progressed. That's what this program allows me to do. Is it allows me to be able to individually progress my athlete's cardiovascular. So I can I, they they can progress at their own their own rate and speed and, and their conditioning level. So, um, you know, if I do that and if I, were, if I, if I don't go out there with the whole team and I say, okay, I got, I got 65 guys out here and I want every one of them to run this, this amount of reps at this amount of, at this time. So in other words, you got this much volume at this much intensity. Every kid can't do that. It's just like if I walked in the weight room, I said, okay, today we're going to do four or five on the bench press for five reps. Well, that's crazy. Every kid on the team wouldn't be able to do that. So basically, if you look at it that way, what you're doing is you're individualizing your, your conditioning program. They, if you do that, you organize it in a way, you'll be able to, be, you'll be able to train these energy systems without uh, surpassing the lactic threshold, which will not deplete your power. Chris, that couldn't be said any better. I, I, I mean, that really is what it is about athletes staying within their exercise tolerance. And again, 
when we had those guys take that six-minute run that was their velocity VO2, we were trying to be specific. And what you're saying right now is those fears that could be taken away just comes from better program design. Coaches are, pro- are prescribing exercise in a better manner that can take those fears away. It is. And, you know, the bottom line is, you know, when, when it comes to the fans, is hey, we want to win. Okay, so you look at the explosive teams like Oregon that, that are getting so many plays off in a game and it's just rapid fire one play after the next and it seems like they're not, they're not taking 10 seconds to line up. Okay, that's great. That's what we want. We want to win. We want to be successful. That's all great. But you know what the, what the bottom line is? And if you talk to these, these, the parents of these players, it's player safety. And that's taking a big hit in football right now is player safety. When you talk about um, the heat illnesses and you talk about concussions, you talk about brain injuries. And um, I, I, you know, I, I feel personally, if I have a well-conditioned athlete, it's going to help this athlete prevent heat illnesses, and it's also going to help with the athlete's awareness and cognitive ability, and it's and and, and therefore it's going to help the athlete uh, decrease brain brain trauma, because when an athlete gets tired, just like anybody, they drop their head, they 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 don't focus. And they don't they don't do things in the manner they would if they were they were well conditioned or rested 100 percent rested. And when you get on the field and you have a well conditioned athlete who's aware, they tend to use better technique, and I think that could lead to less brain injury as well. That's huge. That's huge. Um, you know, Chris, with 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 the the coaches, and we keep talking about unity. I know you put on clinics yourself. You want to speak some more because of, because right now at the secondary level, we obviously want to be able to help every level. Do, do you have anything you, that you've got uh, that you'd like to speak about clinics coming up at U of R? You, you know, put on? Um, every year we have the Central Virginia Sports Seminar, mm-hmm. and it's held at the University of Richmond. And our associate head basketball strength coach, Jay DeMeo, is the, uh, the strength coach that's in charge of, of coordinating it and directing it, and he does an outstanding job with it. And he does a great job of, of, of marketing and bringing in international speakers. And... Um, it you know what this allows our staff to do is to reach out and and look at what what you know the research and the work that's being put in throughout the throughout the entire you know world and you know you kind of get tunnel vision in your sport but one thing that you have to take a step back and realize is that we're all training athletes we're all training the body and the body is created equal and you know it's all put together the same. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to peel the skin away and look inside. How can we fine tune it? Think of it like NASCAR. NASCAR does it every week. They take the car apart. They fine tune each each uh, each part. They put it back together and they try to create a more efficient, faster machine. Well, that's what we're trying to do with the human body. And the more we understand that, the better the better success these strength coaches are going to have uh, with these teams. Hey. And um, success is huge, but but health and, and player safety is, is is the utmost importance. Hey, Chris, the date of that of those uh, seminars you put on the date? They are held in May, towards the uh, towards the towards the uh, beginning of May, and our our dates have not been quite set for this coming year. Um, it'll be 2014 when the next one is, but um, uh, you can look for that. Um, it, like I said, at the beginning of May, it's usually around the end of the spring semester when exams hit because spring ball has ended. The campus usually begins to slow down, and it allows us a good time to hold that. It's also a good break point between all coaches at all different levels, so it allows there to them, them the opportunity to attend the clinic. So um, you can either look, go to the Central Virginia Sports Seminars website or um, – for different blogs, but uh, but that will be put out there, and uh, obviously um, uh, it'll be a great opportunity to get out there and uh, and and learn and be open minded and uh, and you know if you can take away one thing, it's worth it. Hey, Coach Stewart, that that sounds great, man, and uh, thank you for sharing those dates and uh, how people can get involved with it and uh, where to find it. So. We're going to move on because we actually have another guest coming on uh, very soon. But thank you so much for coming on with us and kind of educating our listeners, man. We've appreciated all of this. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And uh, let's encourage everybody to get out there and uh, root on those Richmond Spiders, huh? That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take all right. care, Coach. Thank you very much. Good job. Mm-hmm. 
All right, that was Coach uh, Chris Stewart of the University of Richmond, strength and conditioning coach. Uh, Seventeen years in the field, we've uh, we've been uh, really fortunate um, to have such experienced uh, people speaking with us today. We hope you guys have enjoyed the show thus far. I do want to point out that Mike will be actually taking calls um, after we're done with all the interviews. We have two interviews left, so we're going to hold out on uh, uh, our listener calls uh, until that last interview is done. But Mike will be here for a little while if you guys have any questions for him. If you want to come to the gym and uh, and see what peak, VO te- peak VO2 testing really is um, and have Mike kind of show you what it's all about, you guys uh, come on and sit in Mechanicsville, Virginia. And like I said, you can uh, come check him out whenever you can. Um, we will be on with Coach John McKenna next uh, out of Notre Dame High School. He's had 30 years in the field. So we just got uh, just experienced people at the experienced people. We're expecting him on any second. Uh, guys, I'm trying to catch my breath. Lou, you over there? We look. We we've done less talking and more writing than we've ever done. We're learning, uh, but I think it's good for the listeners. A good switch up to the show. I would definitely agree. I, I hope we have more listeners tonight than than we've ever had because tonight has truly been educational. Um, we're we're all in here. Everyone in the studio's got pins out. We got so many questions to ask, Mike. You might not get out of here at all tonight, man. <laughs> but uh, no, it it is it's, it's truly been great. It's been great. A lot of information. And like I said, we got uh, Coach McKenna to come on the line pretty soon. We're expecting a call from him. And uh, after we're done, uh, we will get into some of the topics that's going on um, NFL-wise. We'll kind of keep it with uh, the NFL. As I said, training camps are going on. We've had a a lot of interesting news in the NFL here lately. With uh, Still got some division previews to get to in the coming weeks. Um, But there's been some interesting uh, QB rankings that we want to get to on ESPN uh, that we'll probably uh, hit on that a little bit afterwards. But, like, again, that comes second to what we're doing in here with Mike. Uh, Mike, how, how's your experience in the in the, uh, in the the studio? It's good to have you on. I, I see you every day. We have these talks uh, all the time, and it's good to uh, finally get uh, some other listeners in on this information. Yeah, this is all new to me, so I'm, I'm here now and trying to do exactly like you're telling me to do, so I just hope I'm doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, it's going, it's going great, Mike, no problem at all. Uh, you guys are used to also hearing from our man on the streets. You know, Leon can't even get a seat at the table tonight, y'all. We, like, we got him in the back making sure everything's uh, cool. Like I said, he's taking notes as well. Uh, everybody's just learning today, man. It's been a great experience. And uh, you know what? Actually, I think we may have time for a break before uh, Coach McKenna comes. Actually, well, hold that thought. As soon as we about to go to break, he comes on. Coach McKenna? Yes. Hi, how you doing? It's Andre. How you doing, Andre? Doing good, doing good. Uh, you've been listening to the show uh, all through the night and, and been hearing all of our guests that have come on and spoken with Mike. I'm going to toss it to him and let the same song roll. Okay, thank you very much. How you doing tonight, Coach McKenna? Good, Mike. How you doing? Good. I just want to let people know that, again, when I contacted Coach McKenna, Coach McKenna is a legend in New Jersey, and I had a chance to see a lot of clinics he runs through Hammer. And, again, he's a person who is very passionate and very knowledgeable about the, the field of strength and conditioning. Coach McKenna, when I, when I approached her about what, where our goal was, the first thing you said to me that really impressed me, because I haven't seen leaders like you in a long time, but the first thing you said to me was, Mike, we need to get the sports medicine department to see a presentation along with the coaches. So not only were you, were you in, enthused about it, but, but again, asking questions, but you had the leadership to say, as a team, let's get the athletic trainers, let's get the coaches, let's get the sports medicine department, let's get people to, to get the same information. And again, I don't know if you discussed it before you went to test your people, but tell us a little bit about your thoughts on, on how you organized the testing for your team. Well, one of the important things I wanted to do, and I felt after hearing you talk several times, um, I was looking, uh, I'm a full-time strength coach. That's uh, what I do at Notre Dame, and I'm responsible uh, to get these kids in the best shape of their life so they can perform at a high level, but also be safe. So when I heard your presentation, I said, well, you know, I really was excited because I feel this is an important part of my toolbox. Um, You know, I I think there's a lot of things that go into this, but with what you're doing, um, with the testing, I feel it gives me a gauge. And what we're going to do, we tested early, um, and we weren't even in a running phase, and we did very, very well on your testing. And then you're going to come back and test again right before camp. So I'll be able to identify by number who, who, what kind of shape my kids are in. And, and, I, and I think uh, coaches, you know, and we're big on X's and O's, and when you, you send kids out in the field, but now I have a number. Now I, it just gives me, again, another tool in my toolbox 
to know what kind of uh, shape my kids are going to be in. And the biggest thing for me is um, I've been coaching for over 30 years. I'm not going to tell you how many years, over 30. But I've been coaching for a long time. I never want to make that phone call to a mother that, to tell them that their, their athlete, their son, their daughter died on the field. So any little thing I can do to prevent that, um, I think I owe that to my athletes. Yeah, that's, that's a huge point, uh, Coach, as much as we expect. And, again, co- we're, we're strength coaches. We're demanding. We want best effort. But, again, to have some tool that can to say, well, the young man just don't have it in the tank. Now we can recognize it, recognize where his weak points are, and then train off data or, or use programs like what you're doing that you had 16% of your team that was below the 40 milliliters. But the truth is I tested the team last week that had 51% of the team below 40 milliliters. And you can't tell looking at them. We can assume the heavier guys are always the lowest, but sometimes you get that skill guy, and the skill guy, he's in a, in a deficiency, and you can't tell by looking. So, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a huge point. Uh, and I was thrilled to death with our results, and I didn't expect anything less because I train um, for that. Uh, just with the, uh, the, the type of sled work we do, the kettlebells, the high-intensity we don't sit around a lot, and um, and well, like I said, we weren't even in a running phase. And I, I think you know, in the whole country, you know, everybody's trying to take their uh, best step forward. You know, we now in New Jersey have the heat acclimation period, which I think was a long time coming, where you've got to acclimate to the heat. But I think you add things like that, you know, having the the ice bath on location, having all those things, and now adding your piece to it just takes us a step further to keep keep these kids safe on the field. You know, there was an article, if people want to Google it, it's, uh, it basically says Notre Dame high football players aerobic test that could save lives. And again, um, the, the uh, gentleman that wrote the article, he, I, I saw him come down and speak to us for about two to three minutes, and you're thinking, how could somebody write an article of this nature that's so complete? But it's got a picture of Corey Stringer, and it says, hope to learn the tragic lesson of the Vikings Corey Stringer. And, I mean, that's really what this is about, is, is us learning from the past and having people like yourself can influence people. And, and I really feel strong about this. People like yourself, Chris, Coach Schrock, all the doctors, it's just a matter of time be, be, before this is going to be as mundane as making sure hydration uh, where, where we, where, and making sure we're having emergency action plans. This is going to be another phase with your leadership. Well, I appreciate that. I, I always tell my wife, one of the most important things in our life are our kids. So when, when those parents send their kids to me, they've entrusted me with something very important to them. And I want to give them the most I can. And if it means, you know, and I just didn't jump on your thing right away. did a lot of research. I talked to you and everything. I talked to other people. And I just thought it would be a great thing to add as part of our total program. And I'm thrilled to death with the show bar. Thank you. Hey, Coach, thanks a lot for uh, coming on with us and spending some time and uh, implementing this program. And, uh, again, this has just been such a great education for our listeners, and uh, we've, been, we've been honored to have you. I appreciate it. You have a wonderful night. All right, you too. Thank you, Coach. You take care. Bye now. And, again, I want to remind all of our listeners that we will be um, – Mike will be here after all the interviews are done, and uh, he'll be taking questions uh, live on the air for as much time as we have. We have one more guest left to get to, Coach uh, Mike Schrock, and uh, he will be on after we take a quick break. Mike's Olympics Gym, celebrating 30 years of competing to be the best. We offer True Fitness Solutions. True Fitness Solutions is a program that offers education – to what is evidence-based, evaluations that identify levels of fitness like peak VO2 testing, an exercise prescription that is written to the exercise tolerance of the individual. Mike's Olympics Gym with the True Fitness Solutions program is the answer to a healthier America. With everything from fat cell reduction, decrease in blood pressure, blood sugar, reverse type 2 diabetes, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides, all of these things are possible with increases in peak VO2 scores. True Fitness Solutions brings unity between the prevention and reactive sides of healthcare. Buy in. Your doctor, True Fitness Solutions, and yourself have the opportunity as a team to stop pretending and start competing. Call now for a free presentation from Mike Craven to see how to change your life at 804-543-9293. 
Again, that's 804-543-9293. And be sure to check out True Fitness Solutions on Facebook. Okay, fellas, it's Kevin from 1st to 3rd here to tell you about the awesome quality and service being offered by our friends at 707, Richmond's premier clothing store located at 310 East Broad Street. 707 is a family-owned company operating in downtown Richmond for more than 30 years. 707 offers a vast selection of men's clothing consisting of fine suits and dress shirts as well as finishings ranging from belts and shoes to neckties and cufflinks that coordinate to complete each ensemble. Visit Diel Bazzani and his team of fashion experts Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Or give them a call at 804-643-0086 to set up a personalized fit. Again, Dial and staff at 310 East Broad Street. Or give them a call at 804-643-0086. 707, the leader in men's fine clothing. And we're back here first to third on Live 365 Soul Cipher Radio. We want to thank you guys for uh, for listening. Um, and, you know, it's really been education to all of us here in the studio um, as well as to you guys. We've been as appreciative of it as you have. And I've been getting texts all throughout the show about how great the show has been today and how people are learning. And, uh, you know, we're grateful for that and grateful for you all listeners. Uh, I mentioned Mike will be taking calls after we're done with our last interview. That's to come in about five minutes. But I understand, Lou, you had a question you want to sneak in there before uh, before our listeners get a crack at Mike. Yeah, several questions, actually. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I will try to keep them limited since we do have another guest coming on. Uh, great guest tonight. We really have been been blessed to have some great guests. Mike, uh, Dr. Sandra Golick was, was mentioning that her research has found that your, your work rate, which is, uh, in, in other terms, your sweat rate, is a clear contributing factor to your core temperature increasing. And I just wanted to know, there, there's, there's a guy who uh, plays in an outdoor league who sent me a text. He's about 380 pounds, plays in an outdoor league. We played last week, actually. Uh, it was about 96, 97 degrees. Um, and he's a former athlete, but he's been inactive for about 10 years. So, you know, when I, when I heard work rate and sweat rate, I mean, he was pouring sweat very early on. What he'd like to know is... What are some basic aerobic exercises that he can do to just lessen his his, his odds of, of the heat exhaustion and, and really having some of the issues that, that come along with being in that intense heat? Gotcha. The first thing he needs to do, he needs to get tested. So it's just like in any type of aerobic exercise. If you've got a VO2, I'm going to throw out 28 milliliters, but you, somebody tells you to, to do a P90X tape. And when you're doing the P90X tape, you're not using but 13 milliliters. Well, that's nowhere as close to your peak ability. So what happens is peak never gets better. You're exercising, but under the false assumption, you're exercising in a mannerism that doesn't create physiological change. So he, wants to, he, he needs to get tested. If he needs to get tested at a very cost-effective price, tell him to give me a call. But then with the data collection, you can write exercise prescription that's going to be unique to him to create those physiological changes. All right, now Dr. Goddick, this is a huge point right now. Dr. Dr. Goddick has also done research to show that people that that do perspire or sweat more, and based on that surface area, if he's a 300-pound guy, let's just say he's got more surface area than a 140-pound guy. Well, if he's losing, I'm throwing a number out, 10 liters of water, there's other issues that are concerned, not just hydration, but the levels of sodium. He might be a salty sweater, and Dr. Goddick's Heat Institute can do sweat testing that shows the exact amount of electrolytes with proper fluid intake that you need to have. And Dr. Goddick is one of the first people who have started this type of testing to, to help prevent the cramping that we still see at the college level across the board. The heavy cramping. All of a sudden, you've got your lead athlete on the sideline. He can't go back out there. Well, this issues of, of getting the right assumption of electrolytes for that person that can come off this patch the person wears and then after so many days of wearing the patch you send it back to Dr. Goddick and they can give you a prescribed value you need to have. 
Awesome. I will be certain to pass that information on to him. Uh, and speaking of elite athletes, you, you, you also mentioned, oh, actually, Dr. Andy Bosack and you in the midst of your conversation were talking about uh, getting athletes to a point where they're capable of having that same boost in the uh, fourth quarter that they have in the first quarter. But, you know, as I was sitting listening, I was wondering, what about being able to maintain that boost from the first game to the fourth game? Is your aerobic capacity something that – can increase over the course of a season? Does it decrease? Uh, how do you sustain it? Great question. So just like all strength and conditioning programs, they've got out season and in season. And what's in season mean? They, because they're doing more skill work, they're doing more of the actual sport, they can't train the same way, but they, don't, they do not tr- stop training. They want those athletes to be able to hold that level of strength through the whole season. Well, same thing with your VO2. If you, if you don't train that energy system, it's obviously this is the biggest myth that there is in football that running a a high-tempo practice where you do film work and coaching in the film room and you run 30 plays in 10 minutes, it uses the aerobic system, but it doesn't develop the aerobic system at max. So this issue about lifting, if I take a weight that's under 70% of my one rep max and and I'm lifting 20, 30, 40, 50%, the truth is, I don't care how many training reps I do with that percent that's so much lighter, mm-hmm. it's not going to carry over to max strength ever right. getting better. Right. So same thing with the aerobic work. There's a stimulus, minimum amount of minutes, maximum amount of minutes for out-season, in-season that can be designed. Man, you guys are, uh, have just gotten a treat right there. Good questions from Lou. I believe our last interview guest is uh, on the line right now. Coach Rock, are you on? I am on, Andre. Thank you. All right, thank you for coming on. And uh, like all of our guests, you've been listening to the show throughout as well. Uh, we just talked a moment ago. And, uh, yeah, I, like I told you on the phone, you're our last guest, so you and Mike have at it. You guys have no time limit. Uh, you guys have at it. I you, appreciate it. Thank you. How you doing, Coach Rock? Can, hey, Coach Rock, can you hear me? I can hear you, Mike. Hey, look, thanks for being on tonight. Hey, before we get started, I want to tell people how I met you. I had um, contacted one of the football coaches in South Carolina about the program, and talking to the coach, he said, you need to speak to Mike Schrock. He's the man in South Carolina. And Coach Schrock, and I'm sorry, Coach, Coach Dula. And Coach Schrock runs the South Carolina Strength and Conditioning Association, and he gave me a chance to give a presentation. He gave me a chance also with Coach Schrock's leadership to meet Sheila Gordon, who works with the athletic training community in South Carolina, to give a presentation to their trainers. So what I'm seeing is there's people out there that, again, Coach Schrock is a strength guy for 30 years. He's an expert in speed strength. But Coach Schrock, tell, tell our viewing audience a little bit. When I first brought up about what we were trying to do, Tell me what was the first thing that went through your mind when, when, we, when we talked and we, and we gave the information, because you were very receptive right from the start. Well, again, like uh, Coach Stewart said, you had done all the homework, Mike, and, it, and you could, no one can deny the facts of, of the presentation of, of, of what we're talking about here tonight. You know, there is a, you know, we're putting our kids at risk by not training the uh, cardiovascular system. I mean, it's it. Look at the facts. It's very obvious. It it, ju- it jumped out at on the paper at me. You made a comment the other night when we were talking, Coach, because you've had such a long history in the sport. Tell us a little bit about because some of us are going to, or, or I know some of the young strength coaches aren't going to remember it. But tell me, what you were saying back in the old day that that aerobic system was definitely trained as a strength. Yeah, and, and I'm sure Coach McKenna will agree with this, with his years in the sport. You know, back in the day, we, you know, we trained the cardiovascular system. You know, we trained aerobically for football. And, and you know, the, 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 you know, the heat deaths and all that was practically non-existent in the 60s and 70s because uh, our players were, were properly aerobically trained, probably overly aerobically trained for the game. And at the same time, that, that was in a, a duration of time where it was commonplace for water to be restricted. Absolutely. That, you know, again, Coach McKenna will agree, and I, I say it with a smile. I mean, if we had done the things today that we did back in, the, you know, my first year as a strength coach was 1969. Uh, if we did the things today that we did in 1969, I'd be in jail. 
Coach, uh, again, here we go about we're all learning, though, because we all want to see our athletes perform at a high level, and we do care about them. That's why we're talking tonight. I'm going to read something, Coach, and again, I keep using the word leadership, but it, it's not just people agreeing. It's people like yourself and, and Coach Stewart, Coach McKenna, that acted on it. And an example would be the National Athletic Trainer's position statement on exertional heat illness. So every athletic trainer has this in their position statement as one of the nine environmental risk factors. It states poor physical conditioning, individuals who are untrained or more susceptible to heat illness than are trained athletes. As the VO2 max of the individual improves, the ability to withstand heat stress improves independent of acclimatization and heat adaption. When, when somebody hears a statement that strong, I mean, I know there's a difference between what us strength coaches do and what our athletic trainers do, but I heard you speak about professional responsibility. Was it any, I mean, you immediately took the ball and ran with it. Well, that, that's what you have to do. I mean, uh, it, it, like I said before, that jumped out right off the page at me, and that's, that's something that needed to be done immediately. Uh, I think that's a big problem in our in the sports community is lack of communication. Everybody waits for somebody else to act, and I and and I think in, with the high school population, I think as the strength coach, I have a little more. I, I don't fight the battles of politics or territory or anything like that. So, if I, if I can prove to my administration that it's going to keep our players safe, they, then they're one hundred percent for it. That's that's huge because again. Everything that, that when we talk about the team, um, I've been in coaches' meetings in the past where it looked like uh, they were coming across the desk at one another to, to prove a point. But I would hope I would have somebody, a, a person like you, that, that if he's got a strong opinion, he doesn't keep his mouth shut. He, he does what's the right thing to do, and he looks for support. Well, you know, uh, I think that's the responsibility of all of us that are in the profession. You know, if, if, if you find an issue like this, uh, you've got to take action on it. You know, I, I think a problem in our, in, in, in our field is that, well, I've been doing this for so long or doing it this way, and nothing has happened. So, and, I, and I'm afraid that, you know, we put our head in the sand for that, and we ignore our pretty obvious facts. Um, coach, Burns, again, y'all are known as a national powerhouse. And, again, tell us a little bit when you took over the program. H how many years have you been at Burns? Because, again, every time you pick up the paper, y'all are on the national spotlight. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, it was a work in progress, Mike. Uh, fortunately, my head coach, Bobby Bentley, was, had a nice program in place. I, I was a Florida transplant. I came up 15 years ago and was able to add to what he had already started and allowed him to concentrate on X's and O's, and, and I could take over the uh, speed, strength, and conditioning program. Had, uh, had his faith, and uh, football is big, and it's very important in our community. It's, it's, it's huge in, in the South, obviously, and, you know, obviously with the success that we, we built over the last years, that uh, it's, been a, it's been a good run. Hey, uh, Coach, thanks for uh, coming on and spending some time with us. Uh, we really appreciate you. And, uh, you know, we continued success, man. Uh, we're so glad that you've adopted this program. Like I said, I've been with Mike for a while now, and everyone who uses it swears by it. So um, we're hoping not only that uh, our listeners uh, who are friends or family members of uh, athletes that are participating in it get this, but also coaches like yourself as well adapt it. Well, it's, Andre, it's going to take a community effort. Everybody has to, to do their part. Uh, when Mike, when I presented the, Mike presented the program to me, I immediately went to our booster club, and I said, look, this is going to, I feel comfortable with this, that if we do this, this is going to make, uh, we're going to ensure our kids' safety or, or be able to get a handle on our kids' conditioning, our, and it's for the kids' safety. We did a test group the first year with just 40 kids, and the booster club said we want to do every kid in the program seventh grade on up, so it's important, and it, everybody in the community has to act on it. You know what, coach? That's exactly the type of action we're looking for. Again, thank you for coming on and spending some time with us. Uh, much success to you. 
Thank you very much. I want to tell the listeners uh, we open up if they're interested in Burns football August 24th, uh, ESPN National Game of the Week. We play a real powerhouse out of Florida, Popka, Florida, uh, 12 noon, Saturday, August 24th on ESPN. Got it. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Mike. All right. And uh, that was the last of our interviews. And, uh, you know, again, guys, uh, if you've been on listening with us uh, throughout this show, you've just been, um, you've just been blown away as we have, I'm, I'm sure. And uh, we're going to take a quick break and kind of just recap with Mike um, from all of the callers and guests that had called in today and uh, kind of wrap things up for the show. We'll be back in a second. This is First to Third. Hey, ladies and gents. It's Dre from First to Third. If you're anything like me, you're always looking for the next challenge or the next excuse to get off the couch and out of the house. Well, today I'm here to encourage you to take up the challenging and fulfilling sport of golf by going to see our friends at First Tee of Richmond, located at 400 School Street. First Tee of Richmond is a state-of-the-art practice and play destination conveniently located in the city of Richmond. The facility features a large grass practice tee for all season practice, as well as a heated and covered practice area for a more private experience. Whether you're playing golf for the first time or an experienced golfer looking to sharpen your skills, the facility also offers a six hole par three course designed to offer true course practice for golfers of all ages. Visit our friends at First Tee and take advantage of their extended summer hours from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday through Saturday. Interested in private lessons or their youth program? Give them a call at 804-646-4074 or inquire online at thefirsttrichmondchesterfield.org. Again, that's 804-646-4074 or thefirsttrichmondchesterfield.org. The First Tee of Richmond, providing a healthy experience through the game of golf. Mike's Olympics Gym, celebrating 30 years of competing to be the best. We offer True Fitness Solutions. True Fitness Solutions is a program that offers education to what is evidence-based, evaluations that identify levels of fitness like peak VO2 testing, an exercise prescription that is written to the exercise tolerance of the individual. Mike's Olympics Gym with the True Fitness Solutions program is the answer to a healthier America. With everything from fat cell reduction, decrease in blood pressure, blood sugar, reverse type 2 diabetes, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides, all of these things are possible with increases in peak VO2 scores. True Fitness Solutions brings unity between the prevention and reactive sides of healthcare. Buy in. Your doctor, True Fitness Solutions, and yourself have the opportunity as a team to stop pretending and start competing. Call now for a free presentation from Mike Craven to see how to change your life at 804-543-9293. Again, that's 804-543-9293. And be sure to check out True Fitness Solutions on Facebook. And we're back here first and third on Live 365 Soul Cipher Radio. Um, you guys have just heard all of our guests uh, from everyone from doctors to professors to actual strength and conditioning coaches implementing uh, the plan that Mike has uh, put together here. And uh, we want to give our callers uh, an invite and a chance to call in right now with any questions you may be having from Mike. Um, again, that number is one 282 6018 Again, one eight six six two eight two six zero one eight. 282 I'm sure we'll be getting a call uh, soon uh, from anyone just trying to get more information and get more and more and more of what we've uh, already had. I know Lou is itching to get in. He's got a couple questions for you, Mike. You can try to squeeze in before our callers get to you. Yeah, actually, Mike, I'd, I'd just like to revisit. We were talking about uh, the conversation uh, with Dr. Andy Bosak and in regards to our elite athletes um, having that same burst in game four that they had in game one. I think we got cut off. So I, I'd like for you to go back to that if, if you could because I yeah. think that's important for the the athletes that are listening. See, when when you think of the, the five forms of strength, absolute strength is considered your one rep maximum, the maximum amount of force you can generate. Well, that's called synchronization. And how much force you can push down through the ground is relative to the hang cleans one rep max, the squats one rep max. So you mean if that's strength base over 12 games because you're not working that in energy system declines, you're going to see kids' speed decline by game 10 because they're not working the, that energy system. So you can't work it with the same volume of lifts as you did in, in the offseason because you got so much other stuff you got to walk on, but, you, but work on, but you can't eliminate it. Right. 
So what about the aerobic system? Same thing. It's a strength. Now, the truth is this in the football community with people's mindset that it's a six-second sport, six-second sport. There ain't no football teams working the aerobic system as a strength. Mm -hmm. So we've got people that when the season goes on, they're beating their self. Mm -hmm. And they're beating their self because they don't look at this as a way of being more competitive. Uh, the big problem I've got right now is I used to be one of these uh, weight room guys that was making guys more weightlifting than athletes. Right. And, and the issue is you've got to have a balanced approach to the energy systems. So whatever, if it's a basketball player, he can't, he can't deny that there's, if the average play is 0 to 20 seconds, he's going to have the lactic acid system involved. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, with the schedule those basketball players have, mm -hmm. the number of games they play a week, if they've got a, a weak aerobic system, they're not going to survive. Actually, hold that thought, Mike. You guys keep getting cut off on that great question. Uh, we got a caller in. Caller, you on first to third. State your name. Hey, this is Travis from D.C. Travis, what's going on, man? Travis is one of our uh, faithful followers, uh, followers and callers. So, uh, Travis, what's on your mind for Mike? Hey, Mike, first I just want to thank you for, for taking the time to, to share all of your insights. It's been, it's been really helpful and, uh, and interesting to hear your perspective. Um, I have a couple questions, uh, really. Um, as far as the, the VO2 max testing, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it, but I've seen it done um, a variety of ways, like both where you're on a treadmill and like you've got a mask on your face and uh, the testing is done that way. And then I'm not sure if it's also done uh, in a similar way with like a beep test where you're running and, sure. and like you, you make certain times and sure. that gives you kind of an idea of where that, how the athlete is progressing sure. both in setting a benchmark and then how they uh, improve throughout the, the course of the season. So my question there is specifically, how is the VO2 max testing done? And um, to what degree um, like nutrition or, uh, or diet plays a role in, in, in improving the uh, the VO2 max of the athlete, and that's all. Thanks. Okay, great question. Yeah, it, it, think of today, if I have a way of estimating something that I can measure with a high degree of accuracy, why are we going to estimate it? So if, if you're using a gas analyzer, and a gas analyzer can bring it to a high degree of accuracy, almost to the same as a, a blood pressure test, you want to be tested so that data that's being collected can be used for exercise prescription. So not just how much oxygen you're using at a given heart rate, but how much carbon dioxide are you blowing off? Where are you starting to cause lactic acid to accumulate? What's the amount of fat that's being burned for, for the, the calories that are being expended? This is all data that comes off gas analyzers that by, by using the computer and doing this, this test, it makes the test not just a high degree of accuracy, but it makes you be able to write exercise prescription exact to the individual. And, and that's what causes physiological change. It's, you don't want to guess. If, if I don't have the sweet spot, like if you've, you've seen people use 220 minus your age and 70 to 85% target heart rate that's written on every tre tre treadmill in, in the country in a health club. Well, I've got a 70-year-old man right now that's an airplane pilot that was in, he's retired now, but he's, he's 70 years old, and he's got a heart rate of 170 beats at his lactic threshold. That means when he's doing aerobic work, his ceiling on his high day of aerobic work is 170 beats a minute. Now, if you do the 220 for his age, they would tell that man, don't let that heart rate go above 129 because that's 85%. Well, what's going to make his heart stronger, working at his peak ability safely or letting him train at 129 and just watch the, the, the cars go up and down the highway? Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to nutrition, I mean, you hit the head on the nail. Any model of strength training for any form, if I'm on a diet right now that's under what's called resting metabolic rate, which is another test you can do with, with one of these gas analyzers that measures oxygen consumption at rest and carbon dioxide expulsion, these resting metabolic rates show the base of calories you sit sleeping, sitting, not moving. So if you test out at 2200, should anybody for any reason, even weight loss, go below the resting RMR? No. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people thinking health is about how much body mass they can drop by deliberately going under the RMR that doesn't allow physical adaption in any form of strength. You know what, that's a great point, Mike, you bring up about the rest and metabolic rate. And, and guys, just so you understand, what Mike is saying is if you sit down in a chair all day, it just all day for 24 hours, 
your body still burns calories and you have to intake that amount of nutrition even if you want to lose weight the, in the thought that mike was talking about guys will eat less than that resting metabolic rate they'll eat less than that thinking well this is going to help me lose weight but what mike is saying is no you need that minimum amount of calories each day so you can change your exercise physiology and even if you're trying to lose weight if you're trying to gain weight uh for whatever you're trying to do you need to be eating at that rest you, you need to be eating well above that uh metabolic rate in a resting sense so uh, thanks for the, to the caller for uh, Travis, who uh, just just brought up a great question. All of his calls have been great, actually. He's called the show uh, multiple times, and you know every time Travis calls, we all listen because it's going to be good. Um, but Lou, uh, did did Mike finish his point to your question? You, you guys got kind of cut off again. Yeah, no, actually, Travis's question and then part of your statement is is a perfect segue into. My last question, it kind of takes us in the opposite direction. Mike, we've been talking about ways to increase your aerobic capacity to essentially strengthen your cardiovascular system. But what are some things that, and this is for all of our uh, high school athletes who are, who are out there listening, what are some things that athletes may be doing every day that is decreasing their aerobic capacity? All right, good question. Good, good question. All right, here's what we want to think. It's an energy system that has to be overloaded. But to be overloaded or work to threshold, can you work at threshold frequent? There's nobody in the world can do it. So all this, this talk about what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, that's a lie. Okay? <laughs> so, so, so that story about the Greek that picked up the calf, and as the calf t turned to be a bull, he got big muscles, tried to go out to a cow pasture and try that. Not gonna that don't work. Okay? So, <laughs> so the key to strength training, the key to strength and conditioning is to know what your peaks are. What are you, in other words, testing? That's why strength coaches test. They don't want to overtrain. They don't want to undertrain. So, so with that being said, let's say I'm under the impression all physical activity that gets the heart rate up. How many people have we said you got to get your heart rate up to get an aerobic response? Mm -hmm. We've heard that, haven't we? Right. I take the my grandma who's going to curves. Okay. She might be sitting still in a chest press machine doing a 30 second interval chest press. Mm -hmm. And as she does that, that movement makes her body consume more oxygen as heart rate goes up. Right. But then she goes over to the lap machine and does the lap pull down. Well, irrespective of where the heart rate's elevating from the straining nature of the weights, mm -hmm. that activity doesn't use enough muscle to have a high oxygen cost. Mm. So even though the heart rate goes to 180 when she's doing the chest press, the oxygen cost of the chest, shoulder, and tricep is nil to nothing compared to walking. So is it is it as good to develop the aerobic system, circuit weight training compared to walking? Heck no. No, not at all. So why, then why would I be kicking a punching bag if somebody told me cardiac kickboxing is the best way to get my martial arts guy uh, fitter? So you mean sparring? You're saying that's how they develop more aerobic strength by doing three-minute rounds? What about those old Rocky movies when they had Rocky running up and down the streets of Philadelphia? So you mean all those boxers did road work to have the endurance to go 15 rounds? Well, can't football coaches do the same thing? You betcha. Because mm -hmm. the three-minute the three minute round is a round of explosive movement patterns, right. but they got to be able to recover to do it 15 times. So the, so the point I'm trying to get at, there's many things today that are being sold and marketed that's, that, that's nothing but fraudulent, and the testing can prove it. You know, in other words, so me standing there kicking my foot on a punching bag mm -hmm. can drive my heart rate up to 200 beats, but it's only one leg dynamically moving. Right. So the oxygen cost for that one leg is not comparable to running. To running. So don't lie and say it is because it's not comparable. And, uh, guys, look, uh, Mike and I have these conversations all the time at Mike's Gym. Uh, again, call us. Call in, and please, if you have any questions, uh, as Travis did, call in at one 282 6018 We're coming up to the last 10 minutes of our show, which uh, means we're getting to our Around the Diamond segment. Mike, I want to give you the floor for uh, a quick segment. A quick second before we get to that last segment, then just any lasting words or thoughts that you want to give our listeners before we uh, head to break and get into around the diamond. First of all, I want to thank uh, all of y'all for giving me this opportunity because you know, the getting the word out is the, is the most important factor. So you can have all kinds of things that are written and an abundance of of knowledge. But if we don't have it shows like this and have people of experts' opinions that can explain why, uh, it never changes. And then this issue about human performance to safety, whichever way you want to play it, it's all about the good of the individual who's investing time. So if, we, if we've made any inroads on tonight, please call or please speak up and talk.
talk to somebody else that they can get a presentation that we can get more understanding and people acting on what needs to be acted on. And, you know, we always advertise it in our uh, commercials with uh, Mike's Olympics Gym. But do you want to give uh, our listeners the number real quick to get in contact with you? Uh, because I know for a fact we have at least two uh, two of our listeners that have told me they'll be getting in contact with you next week to do a peak VO2 test. So um, do you want to give out your number one more time for the, our listeners? And, again, three, can, actually, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, again, they can um, – again, you guys can hear this on our uh, ad for Mike's Gym each and every week. But uh, if you want to give that number out real quick, Mike, so uh, the callers can write it down and kind of get in contact with you because I think you got some new clients already. Oh, well, thank you very much. And it's area code 804-543-9293. That's my cell phone. It goes right to me. All right. Thank you, Mike. And like I said, we'll be back with our last segment of the day, Around the Diamond. After this quick break, you're listening to First to Third on Live 365 Soul Cipher Radio. Mike's Olympics Gym, celebrating 30 years of competing to be the best. We offer True Fitness Solutions. True Fitness Solutions is a program that offers education to what is evidence-based, evaluations that identify levels of fitness like peak VO2 testing, an exercise prescription that is written to the exercise tolerance of the individual. Mike's Olympics Gym with the True Fitness Solutions program is the answer to a healthier America. With everything from fat cell reduction, decrease in blood pressure, blood sugar, reverse type 2 diabetes, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides, all of these things are possible with increases in peak VO2 scores. True Fitness Solutions brings unity between the prevention and reactive sides of healthcare. Buy in. Your doctor, True Fitness Solutions, and yourself have the opportunity as a team to stop pretending and start competing. Call now for a free presentation from Mike Craven to see how to change your life at 804 804- 543-9293. Again, that's 804-543-9293. And be sure to check out True Fitness Solutions on Facebook. And we are back with our uh, last segment of the day, Around the Diamond, for uh, our new listeners. Around the Diamond is a segment where our four panelists, or uh, we like to go in on whatever um, whatever topic we want. It could be pop culture, it could be sports, it could be anything. And uh, the the one thing we do want to make sure to do is give our producer, he has the last word every week. We want to give him enough time to say what's on his mind. And most likely it's going to be political, y'all, but bear with him. Um, I'm going to go up first. Uh, I'll start it off, and uh, I'm going to make it quick. I I find this segment is the best time to do shout-outs to uh, good friends of mine. I want to shout-out Brian Gilmore, teammate of mine that played at American University, extremely hard worker. I hope he's listening tonight, but uh, Brian Gilmore just accepted uh, the job to be a graduate assistant at ODU and start his coaching career with uh, my former head coach, Jeff Jones, over there at ODU. So shout-out to BG, you my man. Uh, Good luck up there, man. And to second. All right. Actually, I'm going to take this time just to recap a a few – of the pieces of information that we got tonight again we had just outstanding guests uh again coach john mckenna uh strength coach there if you guys google he's a notre dame high school strength and conditioning coach uh he mentioned if you google notre dame high football test that can save lives some very good information there that we went over tonight uh also want to make mention that uh coach mike schrock who was on uh, his team will be playing on ESPN, uh, one of the ESPN channels, at 12 noon on August the 24th. Uh, so please, guys, uh, check that out. We'll have all of this information on our Facebook page as well as Twitter for you guys to be able to follow. Uh, it's first to third sports. That's sports with a Z. Uh, so please, please check it out. And lastly, I, I want to say get tested. If you If you didn't get anything from yep. tonight – what you should have gotten was that you need to get VO2 tested because um, everyone needs an exercise prescription. And, again, just big thanks to you, Mike. Really appreciate it. And now the third is your man in the streets, Leon. I want to thank Mike again for coming in tonight. Great show. I feel smarter just by sitting in here and listening to you guys. Thanks for all the call-in guests that we had. I just want to give everyone a quick update on something we briefly talked about last week uh, with the Ed O'Bannon case. A lot of interesting things have got have happened this week. Uh, many of you guys who may be video game addicts like myself, um, the NCAA just announced that they are ending their ties with EA Sports. 
Now, this could be a uh, preemptive strike by the NCAA to kind of cut their losses right now because, this, believe me, this Ed O'Bannon case is definitely uh, gaining some traction, gaining a lot of heat. And um, I would definitely keep everyone informed as far as what's going on uh, with this particular case. And um, on, on the Ed O'Bannon side, uh, we got six current athletes, six current college football players that have actually joined into the suit. Uh, previously, it was just Ed O'Bannon and a lot of former players uh, seeking damages uh, for the NCAA capitalizing on their names, their likenesses, and video games and things of that nature. But now with the six current players uh, joining in, uh, that's actually opening the door for current players to actually you know, seek damages of uh, current income that the NCAA is getting uh, with their TV deals, revenues from um, memorabilia and other merchandise being sold. So this case is really, really gaining a lot of heat and your man in the streets would definitely keep everyone informed as far as what's going on. Uh, now to take it home, home plate, Kev. Uh, I just like to once again thank Mike for coming in. Um, just want to first, um, when when Dre first like broached this like topic to me, um, I told you before that I'm into I'm in coaching and I'm big in like the coach co coaching community. And when he first brought it to me, I was like all in. I was all in as far as like your ad and just giving you like a platform on this show because I know I you know I'm I'm in there I'm in there I'm 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 watching the guys not training the right way you know what I mean they're sitting and I see them I see them every day they're they're doing these drills and these drills but they're not conditioning their athletes and so and then and then they get out there on Saturdays and Friday nights and they're wondering why their athletes are not performing like up to the level that they expect them to. And they're fussing at, I see them, they're fussing at the kids and they're really riding them down. But the thing that they're not understanding is that they are the issue, that they are not training these kids um, aerobically to perform like they want them to perform. So yeah, in practice, when you're taking two minute breaks in between plays while you're sitting there explaining explaining things over and over again, you're sitting there telling the kids something that you've already told them like five different times. And sure, while they're sitting there for that two minutes, they're, they're rested up, they're rested up. So the time you run the next play, yeah, they perform it correctly. But you get out there on Fridays, city coaches. You get out there on Saturdays, youth coaches. And these kids are running play after play after play after play. And, and they're not performing correctly. And so what do you do? You hop in their face. You, you get all up on your high horse. You, you're jumping all up and down. You're waving your hands around. But the thing that you're not understanding is that you're not training them to perform like they do in practice. You're not training them to do that. So, so when Dre first brought this 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 to me, I was all in. I so once again, I just I really just want to thank you. And I and I'm gonna get I'm gonna get this tape on the tape of this show. Every coach I know will have a copy of it so that they can understand. They're not training these these kids properly. They're not training them to perform. And until we start doing that, city coaches, you're going to be behind Henrico. And you're going to be behind Chesterfield. You're going to be on the short end of the stick. Because until we begin to train to perform at a high level, we're not going to perform at a high level. So once again, Mike, I just want to really thank you for, for contributing that to this show and contributing to making this show what we feel like it should be, just a high-quality, informative show, um, just just giving the, giving the audience real information that they can use. We don't just want to be that show that's out here just cracking jokes and, and talking about rumors and and so on and so forth. We actually want to give our listeners information that they can use, that they can take back and use. So again, Mike, just thank you for thank you for coming in. Thank you. That was that is first to third rate sports radio. We are going 
going gone. Mike's Olympics Gym, celebrating 30 years of competing to be the Thank best. You, man. We offer True Fitness Solutions. True Fitness Solutions is a program that offers education to what is evidence based, evaluations that identify levels of fitness like peak VO2 testing, an exercise prescription that is written to the exercise tolerance of the individual. Mike's Olympics Gym with the True Fitness Solutions program is the answer to a healthier America. With everything from fat cell reduction, decrease in blood pressure, blood sugar, reverse type 2 diabetes, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides, all of these things are possible with increases in peak VO2 scores. True Fitness Solutions brings unity between the prevention and reactive sides of healthcare. Buy in. Your doctor, True Fitness Solutions, and yourself have the opportunity as a team